Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is August 18th, 2017. Greetings from Ocean Park, Maine. I am recording early Friday morning, and there's not too much street noise, so I have the windows open. You may be able to hear the surf. It helps keep it cool here to have the windows open, so uh, if if the sound is irritating as you listen to the podcast, just send me an email at podchronicles at gmail.com. And uh, I'll make sure that I do the recording with the windows closed, but I think it might work this morning. I love sitting here at this desk where I uploaded the first podcast nine years ago, looking out at the dune grass and the ocean. It's high tide, so I can't see the surf, but I can hear it, and it's a pretty terrific place to be. Next week, I am going to travel to Casper, Wyoming for the total eclipse of the sun. That's where Darlene and I met and lived for 20 years, and I will be staying with my 91-year-old Casper friend Jack at his home and watching the eclipse in his backyard on the little patio. And I plan to have a full report of that experience for next week's show. For this week's interview, I travel by Skype from southern Maine to New York City for a chat with David Steinberger, co-founder and CEO of Comixology, the digital comics service that was acquired by Amazon three years ago. He helped start the business at a time when it was not at all clear how fast it would grow and how it would change the world of comics and graphic novels. None of us had any idea we were going to be heading into this world of carrying big pieces of glass around in our pockets or in our bags. That would be so amazing for image-based reading. Also this week, we will honor a retailer who, in at least one survey, continues to top Amazon in customer satisfaction. And we might shake our heads in amazement at the latest quickening of Amazon delivery times. In content, I'm going to have something to say about author James Patterson and Presidential National Advisor General H.R. McMaster. Uh, In the news, next to Amazon, my favorite retailer is L.L. Bean, the mail order company founded here in Maine 105 years ago. Darlene, her sister Deb, and I visited the Mother Store in Freeport, Maine this week, as it happens. It's actually like a small campus, and it's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I've always thought it would be fun to head up there at 2 a.m. and buy a canoe or something. While Deb and Darlene shopped, I read my Kindle in a plaza outside the L.L. Bean Cafe and enjoyed the music of a local orchestra. It was a happy visit to Freeport, which is about a 40-minute drive from here in Ocean Park. Forbes reported on August 3rd that L.L. Bean, for the third year in a row, has been named Customer Service Champion in an annual review by Prosper Insights and Analytics. Amazon came in second, which is not where Team Bezos likes to be in anyone's customer survey. Compared with other surveys, this one seems to have, I don't know, kind of a small sample and odd methodology. It's described as write-in votes from more than 6,500 U.S. adults in 2016. But give L.L. Bean its due. They have a legendary guaranteed to last policy, which means you can get products replaced uh, pretty much whenever they wear out, as I understand it. Amazon is in good company, finishing just behind this venerable and still beloved retailer from the great state of Maine. Uh, Next in news is an item referred to me by listener Marie Sotiriou. As you may remember, I am looking forward to when my mother or father can send a vocal message through their house using uh, any of their Alexa devices. This would be handy if one of them needed help and didn't know which room the other one was in. They could kind of broadcast to the house. CNET, citing a German blog, reported on August 8th that Amazon has completed testing on a multi-room audio feature. Owners will reportedly be able to group Alexa speakers so that multiple devices can listen and respond to a single command or question. Amazon did not respond to CNET's questions about the report. I hope it's accurate and that the grouping capability rolls out via a software update to Alexa soon. Also in news, we have another instance this week of Amazon constantly speeding up delivery of its products. In a release August 15th, the company announced Instant Pickup, a free service offering Prime and Prime student members a curated selection of items available for pickup in, well, what would you guess, 20 minutes, 10, maybe 5 minutes after clicking on the buy button? 
No. These items will be available in two minutes or less at five of Amazon's pickup locations in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Berkeley, California, Columbus, Ohio, and College Park, Maryland. The way it will work is you will use the Alexa app on your phone to shop for items such as food, cold drinks, personal care items, and of course, Amazon devices including Echo, Fire TV, Fire Tablets, and Kindles. You will be able to receive your purchases within two minutes from a locker at the pickup location. You can read more about it at Amazon.com slash Instant Pickup. An article in The Street suggests that instant pickup might mean Amazon is taking aim at the convenience store industry, which has largely been immune to online competition so far for obvious reasons. It's also an industry with high margins, so that might make it a tempting target. Uh, finally, news, there are some reasons, I think, to imagine a new Kindle e-reader arriving before the end of this year, one of them being that November will mark the 10th anniversary of the introduction of the original Kindle. I'm thinking anniversary edition, perhaps. Uh, I also saw an item in the ebookreader.com on August 10th reporting a decline in the availability of the top-of-the-line Kindle Oasis in several regions. In Canada, the Oasis is listed as currently unavailable with a note that says, we don't know when or if this item will be back in stock. Delivery time was quoted at one to two weeks when I put an Oasis in my shopping cart today just to find out what the delivery times were going to be. That's longer than the delivery time for the Paperwhite. So maybe this is an indication that a new Kindle is in the works, and if you're thinking about buying a Kindle, I would suggest waiting until we see what happens uh, in the fall. I've mentioned before why I think it'd be nice to get a new uh, top-of-the-line Kindle because of drawbacks to the Oasis. I loved it at first, but I think the design is a little bit clunky with that battery in the cover, partly because it means you can't get generic covers. I, I had a wonderful soft leather cover by Cole Hahn that I used to have on my Kindles, and uh, with the Oasis, you pretty much are stuck with the, the Amazon covers that have the battery in them. The other thing that I thought, you know, a low-end Kindle, as I think about what that might look like, the point there would be to have a price that would have people say, wow, maybe I need to try one of those e-ink Kindles after all. The entry-level Kindle now costs $80. So I wonder, what would that wow price be? Uh, maybe half that, maybe $39.99. For the anniversary edition, that would be a nifty price because when the original Kindle was introduced on November 19th, 2000, 2007, it costs $399, and it sold out in five and a half hours. So how about if 10 years later, Amazon introduced an anniversary edition basic Kindle for one-tenth the price of the original? That would be worth celebrating. For the tech tip, I want to pass along this email from listener Tom Semple, who is a close observer of user interface innovations by Amazon and other tech companies. Tom writes, Fire tablets running the latest Fire OS, Kindle for OS, and Kindle for Android all support pop-up footnotes now. Exclamation mark. I cannot find any reference to it in the release notes of any of these. I suspect Amazon snuck it in along with the left justify option. Anyway, as someone who reads many books with footnotes in them, it is a welcome discovery. Uh, Tom continues, uh, I, one of the things I bought on Prime Day was a Fire HD 8 that was selling for $49.99. I didn't think I was going to buy another Fire tablet as I've been disappointed with the ones I've gotten previously. My Fire HD 6 is or has become unbearably slow with very poor battery performance. But somehow I wound up clicking buy and so far I'm glad I did. Speaking of Kindle in Motion, Tom continues, you no doubt have heard a Harry Potter Kindle in Motion is in the works. I think this has been Amazon's objective ever since the iBooks animated Harry Potter editions. The first KIM Kindle in Motion books showed up a few months after those were released, if I remember correctly, but they need to do the whole series. I hadn't heard about that. that that's, the, of course, going to be pretty interesting. And those Kindle in Motion uh, animations, as I mentioned in like Scott Parazinski's book, they're, I think they're really well done, and uh, Amazon's finally hit on a way to have uh, a kind of enhanced video that works and doesn't distract. <music> 
time for the interview. David Steinberger co-founded Comixology in 2007, and Amazon acquired it for an undisclosed amount three years ago. He continues as CEO of the business, which is a cloud-based digital comics service. More than 125 publishers make their comics available through Comixology, including DC Comics and Marvel. More than 75,000 comics, graphic novel, and manga titles are now available at Comixology.com, and uh, 10,000 of those are available for free if you subscribe to Comixology Unlimited for $6 a month, which I have for the past year. It's a great way to explore comics. Comixology began as an online community for fans of physical comic books, offering digital pull lists at local stores where pre-orders of upcoming comics can be readied for purchase in the stores, often on Wednesdays. In 2009, the company launched its Comics by Comixology app, a digital comics reader and store that became known as the iTunes of comics. I reached David on Tuesday, August 15th at his office in New York City. I began by asking if when he submitted the business plan for Comixology at an NYU business school contest 10 years ago, he ended up winning the contest, his vision would have included any inkling of how successful his startup would be in 2017. No, <laughs> it wouldn't. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, as part of the 10-year celebration, we've gone back and unearthed original business plans and all that kind of thing. And, and, and in fact, in our first uh, pitch to angels, our first business plan pitch to angels, it actually really, you know, one of the things I learned through the business plan competition itself and then, and, and then ongoing as we tried to raise money throughout the time, uh, with Comixology, we, I really learned a lot about not haircutting yourself in terms of your, your opportunity. In other words, show the biggest opportunity you can. In, smart investors are going to give you a haircut anyway, but don't do it proactively. <laughs> and so in the original business plan uh, papers, we even had different financials for if we got Marvel or DC. We didn't even do financials with Marvel and DC and digital. Didn't even make them. And so very humble, I suppose, very humble or, or very dumb in terms of raising money uh, or, or, you know, first timers for entrepreneurs uh, perspective. So, no, we really had no idea. And going back and reading the business plan was really a lot of fun, uh, both in terms of seeing things like that, like, oh, yeah, I forgot that we only did projections for maybe we got one of them. We never even thought about getting both of them, which, of course, we ended up doing. And and uh, and just how modest it was in terms of, you know, trying to be realistic about our prospects. When you did the plan, were there any digital comics at all? Yeah. In fact, the, the plan, uh, what, what people don't know, because they all thought we, we did this major pivot, uh, people freaked out, you know, about this kind of fan site that was allowing people to track what they were buying in print, switched or, or added digital. No, that was always in the plan. And in fact, the the nature of the market segment itself, the way that digital, the way that uh, print comics work, uh, the way they're delivered to comic book stores and then collected into trade paperbacks and delivered to bookstores, drove our decision on how we how we placed uh, the company kind of right in the middle of consumers, retailers, publishers, and creators, connecting all of them. Because they were all, they were a lot at odds, you know. A lot of the risk of new content falls squarely on the retailers because it's a pre-purchase business for them. They actually have to buy all the books that they sell, and if they don't sell them, obviously, it's terrible. If they don't have enough, that's terrible. And so it's very self-constraining, and that's actually in the original ten years ago in the business plan. That it's a self-constraining market uh, in that uh, people don't take risks in content types, and so it. We weren't so smart about it then. The way I look at it now is uh, self-constrained diversity or lack of diversity because of it. it. At that time, were people reading comics digitally, but uh, just in kind of the general way comics were read? Yeah, well, yes, illegally. Oh. Yeah, in, two, in 2006, it was uh, the BitTorrents were start, starting to show up. Oh, and I see. And both Marvel and DC had some issues with their supply channel somewhere in there getting scanned uh, and out even even before Wednesday sometimes. So, oh. but the the fear of the publishers were, were were that if they started selling digitally, particularly same day as print, the retailers wouldn't order as much because again you got they got to order two three months ahead of time. They got to plan and purchase and commit to purchasing. Really efficient for the publishers to only print exactly the amount of books they need to print. Would they were afraid the publishers were afraid that the retailers would 
freak out in essence and stop ordering as much, just anticipating that their orders are going to, that less people are going to read comics. Now, our thesis of course is, was, and is that comics are hard to find. There aren't enough of them. Uh, highly diverse long tail comics don't get distributed at all to the comic book stores. And so never have a chance and that it was only going to in- increase the whole thing. But, but we came in really kind of understanding the publisher's dilemma, the retailer's fear and said, okay, this is where we belong. We belong trying to say comics were disrupted in the 90s. They don't need to be disrupted again. So we're not some you know highfalutin Silicon Valley type saying like you have to destroy the print market segment in order to for digital to flourish. We really believe that if more people had access to comics, we'd be building the segment in general as a whole. I think I read somewhere that about 12% of comics are now read digitally and the rest on paper. Is that your sense of, of what the split is? Well, I can't really get into segment share and, and that type of thing. It, it is still, even if you drill down to new versus new even, it's even smaller than that probably. Uh, remember, digital is all back issues and all front issues, all trades, all singles, plus the subscription business, which is about a year old for us, which doesn't even really have a comparable to the print side. And, and so we we believe very, very clearly. I mean, we, we had a, about 70% of our buyers buy both in print and digital. And hmm. 60%, the last time we did this survey, 60% of people who were introduced to comics for the first time, like ever, on comiXology went on to buy print within just a couple of months. Huh. And so we, I firmly believe with, you know, not more evidence of that and, and kind of the, the, the retailers telling us over and over, Hey, you know, somebody walked in and read had read number one of walking dead for free on your app. And then they bought all the volumes from me that we helped build this growth in the print segment. Cause it's done exactly the opposite of music, right? It's grown over this entire time. I mean, we, the last, this year and kind of a little bit of last year starting to show a little bit of difficulty, I guess. But but otherwise, in the eight years that we've been doing digital, it's been growth period for print. And we believe we've substantially contributed to that. Now, on the, on the book side, Kindle versus the traditional bookstores, there's been a lot of animosity and groups like the American Booksellers Association seem to sort of use that to gain members. I'm imagining that a comic book store seeing that kind of growth that they attribute to your expansion of understanding of comics to a new digital audience, do they are they kind of your friends or how how are you perceived by that sector of the traditional comic store? I would put it in two camps really and it's a very it's there's not a whole lot of gray area in between. Uh the one camp is oh this has really worked for me. These guys said they were going to do it in a way that we could participate, meaning we actually created and still support um, an affiliate digital bookstore retailers can have on their website. And so they can get between 15 and 30 percent of the the merchandise value uh, back to them as an affiliate program. That's probably a minority, I would guess. It's probably less than half. And then the rest are still pretty much they just believe that Amazon is only out to destroy and Mm-hmm. Uh, and don't they might recognize that they got some business and heard a lot from people they discovered new stuff in digital and wanted to buy it in print and so some of them are probably a little like yeah okay maybe 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 i should backtrack a little bit and say there probably is a gray area of people you know uh really just saying like yeah not here nor there i've gained some customers for sure but i, I think i probably lost some too do you think the number of, of comics stores has increased or decreased in the past 10 years you know diamond keeps a pretty diamond distributors the uh single distributor of print comic books to direct market stores keeps a pretty tight lid on that i think it probably has increased a little bit but over the last six months you've been hearing a little bit of the opposite stores struggling a little bit Interesting. I'm new to comics. I didn't read comics as when I was a boy, and I've enjoyed sort of getting to know uh, the Comicsology comics. And so the page, the guided view way of moving from panel to panel, to me that was brilliant. I, it just seemed like it was such a pleasurable way to to really see the art in an individual panel, and, and just the smoothness and the smartness of it. Did, did you invent that, or, or yeah. that technology, how does it relate to, to Comixology's history? When we made the business plan 10 years ago, it's hard to remember this, but iPhones didn't exist. 
and and none of us had any idea we were going to be heading into this world of carrying big pieces of glass around in our pockets or in our bags that would be so amazing for image-based reading uh and so when the iphone came out that was really a huge moment for us and of course uh the app store came out a little bit later than the iphone itself they weren't going to make uh, third-party apps at first. Uh, Steve Jobs actually changed his mind on that. That was late 2008, I guess, when the App Store came out. We made a pull list application for the planning your purchases in print, and some of our to-be competitors started making digital comic book apps. Uh, and what we saw was they were they were cutting out uh, real comic book pages, moving text bubbles around so they fit exactly the size of the screen, which was a two by if I remember right, a two by three ratio screen and that and it just was like a slideshow you just did a slideshow of panels and so hugely work intensive every app every comic had to be its own app so if you wanted the 700 issues of spider-man uh had they had that license you know you'd have 700 apps it seemed kind of not the greatest way and and the reading just didn't feel like a comic book to us and so when we when it came time to really dig into it and it was kind of late 2008 early 2009 when we started creating the uh, reading experience. I actually mocked together what guide of view should look like in a, a keynote application, which is like a PowerPoint application for Apple. And just the moving of the page so that the, the idea was the phone was a viewport to the page, but the page invisibly was behind, was behind it. And this was your way of you know, looking at it through this. And it ended up, it was surprising. Like we were just trying to solve, how do you make text readable and the experience smooth and, and kind of feel like it's comic book is like the whole page is still there. And by the way, we wanted to be able to give the option of showing the whole page. Many of our longtime users won't even remember a time where you could not get out of guided view. When we launched, remember, nobody knows about the iPad yet. When yeah. we launched, uh, guided view was the only way you could read a comic. And if you wanted to see the whole page, you had to turn on an option to show it at the beginning or show it at the end. The idea was, how do we make it small, readable, and not spoil the next panel by seeing a part of it or seeing part of the text or whatever. And that's why the masking, which is one of the key ingredients, it's the reason we have a patent on the, on the, in the, on guided view itself is that that's super unique. And of course, rotation aware and all that stuff that, that our competitors weren't doing. The beauty of it was when, when we, when it landed, when we first did our first demo, I was like, Oh, this, this, the timing of the comic feels real. It feels, it feels like when the, text bubbles are split apart it has a beat and when they're together it doesn't have an extra beat and that's how the creators created it and that and that's one of the reasons so we got a lot more creators on board right away we launched with more comics in july of 2009 than anybody had even put out until then uh and so we got a lot of creators on board that were like oh this actually really works uh i appreciate how you're you're handling this and it's done with math right because we just tell it what the pages are and what the masking is which meant when the size of this change, because this is now closer to 16 by 9 than 2 by 3, uh, or when we have a 4 four by 3 or whatever the iPad is, you have this totally different size, we could just just re- re-export the, it's just math, right? Or when, it went, when the iPad went HD, one of the great things we did for our customers is we upgraded all their comics without charging anything extra. And we just did that. We were able to do that really fast because I'm just redoing the math. Huh. Uh, and and so it, it turned out to be a a, a great uh, efficiency uh, maker too. One thing I've noticed when I, I read on a Fire HD eight, and if the panel is horizontal, if I move my tablet, then it fills the whole screen. And then if I switch to a vertical panel, I can still see it okay, but it's more pleasurable to to change the orientation of my my device. Yeah. Now when I read a Kindle book, I'm not moving my device back yeah, and forth. Sure. So it seems I mean I've gotten used to it, but is there any way around that ergonomics of, of reading with with the guided view given that it, it takes advantage of filling the screen with a vertical or a horizontal pane? Yeah, we, we we should get you to our guided view native comics. Uh there are uh quite a few comics made to be read in guided view. So to, to answer your question directly, uh, in comics that are written to and, and created with people who want to draw in portrait and then landscape and then portrait and landscape, no, there's not going to be a good way around it. I mean, the tablet should, if you know, should help. I mean, one of the things we do in terms of we have all these rules for for authoring guided views. So guided views actually made by people. And one of the things we do right is, can you? you know, keep in mind how often you're making somebody turn their device. Uh-huh. Uh, however, when a page is, you know, 
very clearly very long landscape and then very clearly long vertical. It's very difficult to do uh, until creators, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, Box 13, which was a book we put together to come out weekly and for free back when we first started. So it probably came out in 2000, late 2009, was made to be read in landscape. All the panels are landscape. They're all two by three, I think, to fit exactly the phone. And so that's going to have an amazing reading experience on the phone. Always, you'll 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 just stay in one one orientation. There is a a tax on that on the reading experience, and that's why Guided View exists. Uh, that that as long as people are creators are making it for only print and not thinking about digital, that that will continue to happen. Hmm. The other thing I notice in uh, comparing the experience of Comixology with my Kindle reading is I, I love to annotate pages on the Kindle and if, uh, you know, bookmarks, highlights, notes. And sometimes in some of these more literary comics that I've been reading, I find myself saying, well, I, I'd like to mark that page so I could find it again or, you know, highlight it, export it the way I can do on the Kindle. Uh, I may be an extremely small segment of the of the user that would even want that. But can you imagine that kind of uh, technology being added to the experience in comicsology sure sure that would be a, a great feature we don't announce anything ahead of time but i will tell you trade secret most books that you most uh comics that, and graphic novels and manga that you buy on amazon.com are readable on comicsology they're also readable on your kindle and oh. guided view is on kindle we added it earlier this year so you actually can read in guided view there are some subtle differences certainly all the uh typical uh, features are available on the Kindle set there as well. In other words, if I got a, a Kindle comics, it would have bookmarking and, and those features in addition to the to the guided view? You know, I believe so. I believe it has a standard Kindle uh, feature set. Yeah. Yeah. I want to break in here on Friday to say I was I tried reading a Kindle Comics title, Marie Kondo's The Life-Changing Manga of Tidying Up, on my Fire tablet, and sure enough, I was able to create bookmarks and share the book via social media. Those features were available when I opened the book in my Kindle app on the Fire. Uh, by the way, I could not find that Marie Kondo book, which I love. It's a graphic novel, or actually a manga version of her bestseller that I've used to tidy up some of my places in Denver. Denver and Cambridge, uh, it's it's not available at, at Comixology that I could find. And according to David, I guess that makes it unusual. The Kindle version of her comic had bookmarks, but I could not make notes while reading the book. So I think there are still features of Kindle reading that Amazon might bring to the comics and graphic novel experience, whether we're reading in the comics app or in uh, on the Kindle app. And now back to the interview. And you'll see, like, on, the, on your desktop when you shop, you'll actually see... You know, you've got the little boxes that say print, hardcover, Kindle. You'll actually see Kindle plus Comixology. Oh, I see. And that means that purchase is available if you log in with your Amazon account on Comixology to be read there or on a Kindle uh, app or device. And are there comics that if I buy them on Kindle, I'm just buying it as part of my Amazon account and it's not sort of tied to my Comixology account? Very few. Almost all of I mean, I, I don't even know a publisher that isn't... Uh, across how about the other way are there more comiXology only titles that aren't available on kindle uh maybe a few i mean we've we've made a huge effort over the last three years since our purchase uh by amazon to ensure that the catalogs are the same i see I so see. yeah you'll probably fi find a few stragglers but very few uh, so you've been part of Amazon for three years now. I, I, I see, you know, John Mackey from Whole Foods, he's about to become part of the Amazon family. If you had a chance to, maybe he's already called you and asked this question, but if, if you were to guide anyone who's had a, a terrific startup, they're the co-founder, CEO, and now all of a sudden they're entering the Amazon family, would you say have any tips on how to do it smoothly that you learned from Otis Chandler or anybody that what, what's the best path to make this fairly substantive transition from running your own show to being part of a company as big as Amazon? I had the, the great luck to be able to talk to both the founder uh, of uh, Audible and Otis, the founder of Goodreads. I, I don't think that uh, the founder of Whole Foods is probably going to give me a call. I'm a, I'm a much uh, a smaller fish. And by the way, that's a discreet business. 
right? That's a different business than Amazon runs. You, you have to think of us as we were the premier and are the premier digital comics solution, reading solution, which is a core piece of what Amazon is. And so and Goodreads is the same, right? So Goodreads, both Otis and I uh, report into the same teams, right? We're part of the Kindle content organization. And I'm in charge of Kindle worldwide for comics. I both run the subsidiary, and I'm, and which is very smart, right? It means that I have to, I look at the entire business and we need to invest in the right places. And I understand the entire worldwide uh, comics business. So to some, so to somebody like the Whole Foods uh, CEO, I, I, you know, <laughs> First of all, they're probably much, they're much bigger. So they have a lot more structure than we did for anyone at a hundred, 120 people on a growth spurt. Um, you're not going to have spent the right amount of time, uh, on your HR systems, on your, uh, employee growth systems on, on reviews and making sure you're taking care of all that. So to me, one of the best things we did is we availed ourselves right away to integrate into all the resources that Amazon provided their teams, um, including subsidiaries. And I've heard exactly the opposite. There are other subsidiaries that have completely resisted that. Honestly, like we, we've benefited a lot from that kind of structure. I think our employees have benefited tremendously from it. And so I feel very lucky. I, I, you know, I think Whole Foods probably has a lot of really good uh, systems for that type of thing. And in that case, I might be a little more uh, circumspect for integration because integration can be, can be difficult. And you know, getting systems to work together can be can take up a lot longer time than you, uh, more of your time than you expect. You know, I, I, other than that, I think what what was amazing about being a, a, a new subsidiary of Amazon is that they let us discuss and pitch and d- talk about what the vision should be, and we all together, along with you know the analytical tools and focus that Amazon has, and and we've learned a tremendous amount on how to approach a problem and you know, kind of the narrative quality of, of how Amazon likes to approach new features and, and new, new products. Great benefit from doing that and a lot of freedom to to work together to make the right decisions. I, I've always been fascinated by this method that Jeff Bezos has of, uh, as I understand it, there's a new initiative. Somebody writes a long memo. Everybody reads the memo in silence at the meeting and then starts discussing it. And it's generally so often, I think, like a press release announcing a new product or something. Have you ever uh, been in that kind of a meeting where you were presenting something, you wrote the memo uh, proposing it, and then you had to sit around for 10 minutes as everybody reads it in silence before they discuss it? it you just describe just about every meeting I'm in. Really? So that's just the standard way that... Yeah. Was it just sort of odd and, and a little bit... Uh, stressful the first time you did it oh yeah when you when you start in yeah absolutely the, the first few meetings like this it feels completely foreign and very odd but what you understand very quickly and and what i've really become accustomed to is the amount of concise and critical thinking that has to go into preparing those kinds of documents knowing that anticipating and understanding who's going to be there and reading it and uh, what the questions might be just makes it all go a lot faster and gets gets you to think much more deeply about your your problem and solution way more than some bullets on a PowerPoint could. So yeah, I find it a very I find it very effective. I don't think I'd move away from it actually. Yeah. Are you ever any drawbacks to it, or is there anything you give up by having that method of moving through a new idea versus kind of the PowerPoint traditional way? Look, I, I would be uh, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't admit that occasionally I, I would like to shoot from the hip a lot more, which is what we did in the in the uh, startup environment. But we mm-hmm. make way better decisions, so I, I'd have a hard time arguing it. Other than other than like sometimes it's it's hard to go that deep, but that's that's the culture, and that's and that leads to better results. So you know sometimes you have to raise your hand and cry foul on like too long a preparation period, you know, to, for a document. But, but for the most part, no, I, I think it's, uh, and in fact, I've, I've completely gotten used to it. Anytime we bring in a new leader and we sit down for the first couple of times, I I'm reminded that it is, it is not normal <laughs> and that, and that, and, and yet it is normal to me. And I, and I think it just, it just really works. It, it really reveals the thinking of the person presenting and, creates an atmosphere of deep, very quick, deep discussion about the merits of an idea. That's fascinating. 
I see that Comixology Submit, which it looks like it's directed by your co-founder, John D. Roberts, uh, it, it reminds me of Kindle Direct Publishing, which came out when the Kindle did it, enabling authors to use the platform. Uh, do you know enough about Kindle Direct Publishing versus what you're doing at Comixology to contrast and compare? Or what is the challenge any different? Yeah, yeah, I, I know a lot about it. So KDP is a open system. Uh, anyone can put in their book. There's no gatekeeping. There's no review. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, making sure you're not or, or you know, trying to understand if you're printing other other people's copyrighted material or that type of thing. But submit is a gated program. So you submit work to us and then we say yes or no. This is of a high enough quality to stand by the professional publishers that we carry. Uh, and so it's a badge of quality. I could see a world where we have KDP for comics as well, where it's open and then submit becomes a program that, you know, highlights the best of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, but currently comics uh, is, is gated in that, in, in that anything that we present um, from our submit creators has been reviewed and determined. I mean, look, it's light handed. I don't mean to make it sound like it's some huge gauntlet. If we think anyone will buy it, we'll, we'll, put it up and you know it's not like your drafting has to be perfect you know xkcd the website that's you know web comics based on stick figures is amazing and would be absolutely welcome in submit so it's not it's not like a you know drafting right. qualification or anything like that but but that's the big difference do you know if jeff bezos read comics when he was a boy <laughs> Anyone, anyone who's man, who manages to get uh, a guest appearance in a Star Trek movie had to have read comics. <laughs> That's true. Have you ever had a chance to talk comics with him and, and share experiences? Or no, I haven't. I haven't. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun. Is there one that you would recommend to him that uh, kind of a high quality uh, example of what you're doing at Comicsology that it would be interesting for him to have a chance to experience? Well, at Comixology itself, yeah, there are probably some submit books I could serve up. But honestly, if he's not currently reading comics, to understand kind of the vast range of books available, I'd probably give him something like um, John Lewis's March yeah. series, just because it is a pinnacle example of what comics can do. I mean, other really great examples, like I'm, go I'm, I'm just after this, I'm going over to Bryant Park in New York City to interview Vivek Tawari, who wrote The Fifth Beetle which is about Brian Epstein and uh, is a wonderful, incredible graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And part of our goal at Comixology in general is to open people's eyes to the great variety and, and different uh, of different content, genres, creator types, tons of diverse books. It's one of the reasons we made Comixology Unlimited in general. So you could dive in and just wade through, you know, 10,000 books and see what, what turns you on, what, what you connect to. And, Otherwise, you know, I, I can see he's a great Star Trek fan, and there's a great there's a Star Trek ongoing series uh, from IDW that is based in the new universe from J.J. Uh, Abrams' movies that's really great. It's a terrific, uh, feels like watching it, the new uh, universe in a TV show format. Yeah. So really, really great comics. So I try, you know, like anybody, it's our job, right, to figure out who you are, what you're into, what you like and give you the comic book that matches that. So March is a great example of what comics can be like. Uh, and I think, you know, has a social importance right now, uh, probably forever. And, uh, and on the other hand, he likes Star Trek. So I'd probably match him up with something I know he's into. Makes sense. I have been speaking with David Steinberger, co-founder and CEO of Comixology. Thanks very much, David. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks. Turning out of content, I know some of you have enjoyed reading Beneath a Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan, who was my guest on TKC 463 months ago. It's a terrific World War II novel based on a true story, and I was pleased to hear from Amazon Publishing this week that film rights for the book have been acquired by Pascal Pictures. The actor is Tom Holland. I'm not familiar with him. He's uh, starred in a Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Homecoming, and he is attached to play the lead. Mark's book has been selling really Really well and currently sits at number six on the Amazon charts list in the most read fiction category. That puts him behind A Game of Thrones, The Handmaid's Tale, The Late Show by Michael Conley, All These Worlds by Dennis E. Taylor. That's not one I'm familiar with, but it's uh, obviously popular. And Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. That's pretty good company, I'd say. 
I didn't make too big a deal of it when I spoke with Mark, but I did notice that one author who seems to have a real problem with Amazon, James Patterson, wrote a glowing blurb for Beneath a Scarlet Sky, which is right on the front cover. And, of course, that's a book that's published by Amazon Publishing. That may be why Patterson, to my ear, sounds a little less strident in his comments about the company, even while talking about The Store, a new book with his name on it, and another author's, Richard DeLallo, that casts uh, a company that sounds a lot like Amazon. Amazon in a very dark light. Here is an excerpt of Patterson's August 14th interview on Market Watch. You are a guy uh, who could get Jeff Bezos on the phone, right? And you could say, Jeff, look. I, I don't know. I mean, I could. Oh, get come him. on. Of course probably, you could. He probably would, eat, would read a letter if I said. I don't know. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I, I met him once. Yeah. How'd it go? It was fine. I mean, I, you know, what I said at that point was that you know, the, the traffic at bookstores at that point was down about a third because a lot of people had gone over to ebooks. And I said, the problem with that is that a lot of these people have kids. They're not going into bookstores anymore, and their kids have not made the switch to ebooks. And I said, that's a problem. So there are a lot of households now huh. where, you know, mom or dad used to go to the bookstore, bring the kids, so that they were getting books to the kids. Mm-hmm. And I said that, you know, he was in a position to change that, even if it meant a lot more kids reading on ebooks. And, you know, he said at the time I'm on it, I, I don't know that I've seen evidence of that, but, uh, yeah. Well, so you and, you and I have talked about this before, right? Your interest in getting kids and, and people outside traditional sort of mainstream, you know, novel readers in, in books, right? We talked about book shots. We've talked about a bunch of other stuff you've done. Are, do you take any heart from the fact that uh, Amazon now has actual brick and mortar stores in some places? Not particularly. No, <laughs> I, I, you know, tough I, guy to please. I, 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 it's kind of neutral. I know. I mean, that they are replacing. You know, independence and well, you know, borders. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't well, yeah. think it's necessarily a, a, a big step or a good step, but it might be. We'll see where it goes. And Patterson's new book, The Store, is kind of getting bombed in reviews on Amazon. There aren't that many. There's under 20, but 70% of them are one star, and that results in an average rating of 1.7 out of five. A sample one-star review posted August 14th by Brian Kane was titled, The Lack of Quality is Jaw-Dropping. I refuse to believe that the author actually wrote this drivel. It has all the effort of a rush first draft done by a first-year college student who pushed it under his teacher's door after hours. Mr. Patterson would do well to find better ghostwriters or at least give them a bit of constructive criticism now and then. The plot is contrived with logic holes a bus would disappear into. It has a twist that makes zero sense, and it's barely long enough to qualify as a novella. Pro tip, four paragraphs do not make a chapter. In short, this is god-awful. I want my 13 bucks and two hours back. Well, two hours, that's not a very long read. Over at Goodreads, where there are a lot more reviews, it's more of a normal kind of a, a rating. It's $14. I think it's a book I'm not going to buy. I did read the sample. I didn't think the writing was terrible, but I could see where it was going, and it didn't look like a uh, direction I was going to enjoy spending a lot of time following. But maybe Patterson is uh, mellowing a little, and he certainly does know of at least one book published by Amazon Publishing that is a significant book, a great book, and one that he raved about in a blurb. Also in content, I'll have a link to an, a Washington Post article in which I found a link to a book that pleased me because of the ease that it connected with my Kindle. This is the first time I've seen something like this coming out of a newspaper. The story was published on August 4th, and it was about President Trump's National Security Advisor, General H.R. McMaster. About halfway through the piece, the authors mentioned a book McMaster wrote titled Dereliction of Duty, Johnson, McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Lies that Led to Vietnam. The title was in blue in the, in the newspaper story, indicating a link as I read it on my Fire tablet. When I clicked on it, the link took me directly to a sample of the book that I could begin reading on my Fire with just one click from the news story. Above the sample, there were links titled View Book Details on Amazon.com, Read in Kindle, Share, and Buy. I've always wished there were links like this in the New York Times, especially in the book review. And, you know, they could do it so that it wouldn't always just go to Amazon, as in this case, there could be links to Barnes & Noble and other places to buy books. Of course, the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos, so this level of integration with Amazon.com is not a surprise. As a longtime ebook reader, I was delighted to see how easy the Post was making it to go deeper into a story with links to a book that I could sample, buy, and read on my Kindle. Well done.
That's it for this week. As I said in the intro, next week's show will bring you my on-the-scene experience of the total solar eclipse in Casper, Wyoming. Be sure to wear protective glasses if you are watching the eclipse. I won't have to wear the glasses during the two minutes of totality in Casper, but anything shy of the totality on either end, be sure to wear those glasses to protect your eyes so you can keep on reading. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my show. Have a great day. Bye. 